Alright, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about funitrazepam, a synthetic therapeutic under the family of drugs known as benzodiazepines. Uh, its trade name is Rohypnol. More informally, it's known as Rufies. It's used primarily as a sedative or hypnotic for treatment for insomnia, but it also, at lower doses, has some anxiolytic or anti-anxiety properties. It's also orally ingested. These are the main functional groups on flunitrazepam. Number one is the electron neutron fluorine group. Number two, the nitro group, relatively nonpolar. Number three, the methylated nitrogen, also relatively nonpolar. Number four, what structurally resembles a ketone, other than there being a nitrogen where there should be a carbon. Uh, it is relatively polar. And the weakly basic nitrogen is essentially what conveys overall weak basicity to flunitrazepam. It is very easily absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract, about 64 to 70% bio bioavailability. You can see from the log POW that it is hydrophobic, so interaction with membra the membrane environment is achieved very easily. Simple transcellular diffusion is achieved very easily, and at any pH found in the gastrointestinal tract or, the physio or other physiological pHs, rohypnol will be neutral. So as I said, based on those facts before, uh, flunitrazepam is able to diffuse across most membranes. This includes the blood-brain barrier as its primary location of activity is in the central nervous system. It's distributed throughout the blood and the plasma. Uh, it's metabolized extensively and there are some active metabolites and essentially this means that flunitrazepam can be distributed multiple times to exert its effects, whether in an unmetabolized form or in a metabolized and active form. Although this is to a lesser degree when it is an active metabolite. It's metabolized by the liver. Uh, it can be hydroxylated by acetochrome P450, reduced by NADH or demethylated. You can see the center row on the far left, that is flunitrazepam, the parent molecule. There are three metabolic pathways that it can go in, in which it can go from here. Uh, towards the bottom left is hydroxylation by cytochrome P450, ultimately conjugated by glucuronic acid and excreted by the kidneys. The top left is the first active metabolite, flunitrazepam, created by demethylation. And in the, redu the reductive pathway, you see uh, seven amino flunitrazepam can be acetylated or hydroxylated. Uh, when it's acetylated, that eventually forms an inactive metabolite, and when it is initially hydroxylated, that forms the second active metabolite, seven amino three hydroxy flunitrazepam. When it's ingested orally, which is most of the time, there is a there is a first pass effect, about ten to fifteen percent of flunitrazepam is brought immediately to the liver via the hepatic portal vein and metabolized and excreted. This is, though this is a, a significant percentage, it still has little substantial effect on overall distribution of the molecule because, again, as I said before, there is about a 64 to 77% bioavailability of flunitrazepam. <laughs> It is excreted by the kidneys after being picked back up from the bloodstream after met metabolism by the liver. The inactive metabolites can be excreted immediately, while the two active metabolites are typically able to travel around the system a little bit more and exert their effects, which are similar to flunitrazepam, uh, for an increased period of time until they are also excreted in the urine. Flunitrazepam itself is the ultimate toxicant, is the effector molecule, uh, for the most part. As I said, there are active metabolites, so some effects of the drug can be attributed attributed to a lasting effect of these active metabolites, but most of the time, any therapeutic effect, any toxic effect, whatever context you may be in, what you're seeing is attributable mostly to flunitrazepam. The direct action of flunitrazepam is on the GABA-A receptor, an ionotropic ligand-gated receptor, which allows chlorine ions to flow into the neuron 
after GABA binds and opens the pore in the GABA A receptor. This flow of chlorine ions hyperpolarizes the neuron, which is inhibitory in nature. So GABA and GABA A receptors are essentially involved in the regulation of neural activity. <clears throat> The more indirect at target of flunitrazepam is the parvocellular neurosecretory cells, which are located in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. This area is involved in the production of corticotrophin-releasing hormone and vasopressin, which are both involved in the HPA axis. This is the most important function of the parvocellular neurosecretory cells, and essentially all you need to know is that it is a major component in the HPA axis, which is a major component of our stress response. When the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA binds to the GABA receptor, chlorine ions are able to flow into the neuron. When flunitrazepam binds to the GABA-A receptor, it induces a conformational change. This binding is to an allosteric site, not the active site. And upon this conformational change, GABA now has a higher affinity for the GABA-A receptor. So overall, this increases the activity of GABA at the GABA-A receptors and increases the inhibitory action of GABA in the central nervous system. Here's a look at the GABA-A receptor. You see the BZD site is where flunitrazepam would be binding between the gamma and alpha subunits. And the two GABA sub uh, binding sites uh, in between the alpha and beta subunits is where GABA would be binding to open up the chlorine pore to allow chlorine to flow into the neural cell. Here's another, another look at the receptor uh, in the lipid membrane of the neural cell. And as you can see, there are the two GABA sites, the one benzodiazepine site, and some other sites for other, um, for other things to bind. There is a, a binding site for ethanol as well. Uh, ethanol also acts on the, uh, the GABA system. So it's important to recognize that GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, and what this means is that it is found throughout the entire brain, the entire central nervous system, and it has effects or a function throughout the entire central nervous system. When we're talking just about the decreased function of the parvocellular neurosecretory cells, that essentially just gives you a de decreased stress response. So inhibition of c uh, corticotropin-releasing hormone and vasopressin, which are major players in the stress response, uh, decreases overall stress response, decreases anxiety. And it, when you're in the clinical setting, this is desirable. Uh, the sedative properties, the anxiolytic properties are desirable in the clinical setting um, for treatment of those w with anxiety disorders, with insomnia. However, toxicity comes about when uh, doses reach a level where GABA activity is widespread and strong enough to shut down some essential processes for survival. So this, uh, by nature, is very acutely toxic. There is no real evidence of increased risk of cancer or any carcinogenic properties uh, concerning flunitrazepam. However, GABA itself has been implicated in some forms of cancer, in the proliferation of some uh, forms of cancer, and as we know, flunitrazepam increases GABA activity so there is some possibility here for some indirect influence on the proliferation of some forms of cancer with use of flunitrazepam. These are the regions of the body that have contained GABA-A receptors and GABA and are susceptible to uh, an effect on cancerous cells when GABA is either up or down regulated. So you can see in the brain the liver, the pancreas, and the prostate, there are all cases where upregulation of GABA has an either stimulatory or a non-disclosed effect on proliferation of cancer cells, so a promotion of mitotic processes within cells that probably don't need to be undergoing these processes. So these are some of the examples, I guess, of where it's possible for GABA activity to influence cancer proliferation, and if Flunitrazepam is freely distributed throughout the system, uh, maybe not just the brain, maybe in one of these regions, and it is uh, upregulating GABA activity in these regions. There is some po possibility for a link there. Um, in terms of organismal effects, the smaller and lower doses used in the clinical setting are typically thought of as quite beneficial, 
those who suffer with anxiety disorders or with insomnia could be finding these disorders quite debilitating and uh, a drug such as Rohypnol could be quite helpful in helping those people return to a better quality of life. So in terms of anxiety, <clears throat> the lower doses, of course, we're interested in the effect on the uh, parvocellular neurosecretory cells. But higher doses, typically seen outside of the clinical setting, is where the risk arises because if GABA is active throughout the entire ner nervous system, then any process controlled by the central nervous system is at risk of being influenced and inhibited by GABA. So outside of the clinical setting, this is where Rohypnol has gained its name of the date rape drug. So less serious, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of toxicity, less serious, but the sedative properties put people in a very potentially compromising position in terms of personal safety. So being incapacitated to the point where you're unable to fend for yourself, you're uh, easily taken advantage of. This is one side of the risk, but there is also, at even higher doses, there is the toxic risk of uh, respiratory depression, of cardiovascular depression, of coma, of death. So it kind of has two sides to it. One side being a very therapeutic and beneficial, probably regarded as very helpful side, and another uh, as a drug that <clears throat> has allowed uh, many people to uh, take advantage of others uh, and essentially place them in positions that they would not normally be placing themselves in otherwise. So on the organismal level, there are two ways really to be looking at Rohypnol, and it pretty much comes down to dose. That's about all I have for today. Thank you very much for your time.